Hi, this is Stephanie from the Pasadena Public Library, and this is Intro to Sewing Part 2. In this video, I'm going to cover fabric basics and how to read a sewing pattern. I'm going to start by going over some basic fabric terminology and help you to understand the different kinds of fabric. Then I'll talk about how to follow along the commercial sewing pattern, like the kind you'll find for sale at your local fabric store. Let's get started! So there is a lot of fabric terminology you'll need to know before you can follow along with a pattern. Let's go over some of the basic terms you'll see often while sewing and buying fabric. The outer edges of a length of fabric are called the selvage. This area is tightly woven so as not to unravel. It may have manufacturer's info printed on it, like the designer, the manufacturer, and the fiber content of the fabric. Next, let's talk about the grain line. The grain line is the direction of the lengthwise threads of a fabric, and it runs parallel to the selvage. The crosswise grain line is the direction of threads running at 90 degrees to the selvage. So these run across the width of the fabric. The bias is the direction 45 degrees across the fabric, and this is the direction with the most stretch. So if I hold up a length of fabric here, you can see at the top is the cut edge, along the sides are the selvage, this is the grain line, this is the crosswise grain line, and then diagonal across the fabric is the bias. Another term you'll need to know is the seam allowance. So seam allowance is the width from the raw edge of the fabric to your stitching line, and your pattern should specify what your seam allowance is. Common garment seam allowances are half an inch or five eighths of an inch. Quilting seam allowance is usually one quarter of an inch. You use the distance lines on the needle plate of your sewing machine to help you keep an accurate seam allowance. You might not think that being off by one eighth of an inch would make a big difference, but if you have six panels being sewn together, that would mean your finished project would be off by one and a half inches, which can mean the difference between a well-fitting garment and something too tight to even wear. So accuracy in cutting and sewing is vital to making sure that everything comes together properly. Now let's talk about knit versus woven fabric. Woven fabrics are comprised of multiple threads crossing each other to form a fabric. You have a warp and weft, which are running crosswise and lengthwise. A knit fabric will stretch easily and usually doesn't fray when cut. Knit fabrics are used to make garments that have some stretch, like t-shirts and stretchy dresses and skirts. Woven fabrics have minimal stretch and the raw edges will need to be finished to prevent them from fraying. Some examples of woven fabric include quilting cotton or this shirting fabric that you see on the right. Your pattern will always specify if it is designed for woven or knit fabrics. These two kinds of fabric behave very differently, so it's important to purchase the right kind. Now let's talk about fiber content. Fibers can be plant-based, animal-based, man-made, or a blend. Plant-based fibers are made from fibers that occur naturally on plants, like cotton, linen, or hemp. These kinds of fibers are easy to launder, sew, and press, and they tend to be long-lasting. They tend to be crisp, prone to wrinkling, and breathe very well. Animal-based fibers are cultivated from animals. These include wool, angora, silk, and cashmere. They tend to soak up water very well and be relatively lightweight and warm for their size. They do tend to be very pricey, and they can be a little bit difficult to work with. Man-made fibers fall into two categories. They can be made from plant cellulose or petroleum. Plant cellulose is used to make rayon, viscose, tensile, modal, and acetate. A chemical process is used to break down the plants into plant cellulose, 
then it's woven into fibers. These fabrics tend to be soft, drapey, and resistant to wrinkles. Due to their shifty, drapey nature, they can be tricky to cut and sew, but they do breathe well and are comfortable to wear. The other category of man-made fibers are made from petroleum-based synthetic fibers. This includes polyester, acrylic, nylon, and spandex. These fabrics are easy to wear and they don't tend to wrinkle. They tend to have a harsher environmental impact and can be very difficult to press or sew with. They also don't tend to breathe well, as you probably know if you've ever worn polyester on a hot day. Often fabrics can be a combination of multiple types of fibers. For example, a cotton spandex fabric or a linen rayon fabric. These blends combine the features of different fabrics. Next, you'll want to consider the weight of the fabric. Weight has to do with the thickness of the fabric. Very lightweight fabric, up to four ounces per yard, tend to make great blouses, shirts, linings, and summer dresses. They may need to be lined as some can be transparent. Some examples include cotton lawn, foil, silk chiffon, and gauze. In the image at the left, this woman is wearing a dress made from a very lightweight high-quality cotton lawn. Next we have lightweight fabrics which are around 4 ounces to 6 ounces per yard. These tend to make great blouses, shirts, skirts, dresses, and craft projects. Some examples include quilting cotton, muslin, rayon chalice, crepe, chambray, and jersey knit. In the second image, this woman is wearing a skirt made from quilting cotton and a top made from a jersey knit. Medium to medium heavyweight fabrics are 6 ounces to 10 ounces. These are good for thicker shirts, skirts, and pants. Some examples include flannel, some heavier linens, French terry, tensile twill, and some lighter denims. In the third image, you can see this woman is wearing a jumpsuit made from a medium weight linen. Heavyweight fabrics are 10 plus ounces per yard. These are hard wearing fabrics that are good for coats, jackets, bags, and upholstery. Some examples include canvas, heavy corduroy, denim, and wool. In the last image, this woman is wearing a coat made from a heavyweight wool coating fabric. There are more fabric categories than I can possibly cover in this video. If you are unsure about the fabric to buy for a given project, make sure to check the fabric suggestions that come with your pattern. Patterns will specify woven versus knit, the weight of the fabric, and give some examples of good types. Look for information about the width of the fabric. Fabric tends to come in bolts that are either 44 inches wide or a wider width around 58 inches. You will need to purchase more fabric if you're working with the narrower width. We'll cover how to determine the yardage to purchase a little bit later. Consider if your pattern calls for lightweight, medium, or heavyweight fabric. If buying online, you may see info about weight or an ounce per yard listed. Next, you wanna consider the drape and the fiber content. Does the pattern call for a drapey fabric or something more structured? Fiber content can help tell you how drapey a fabric is. Natural fibers like cotton and linen tend to have less drape than something like viscose, rayon, or silk, which are very fluid. Next, you want to consider the scale of the print if your fabric has a design. Often, online fabric stores will have a ruler or a quarter next to the fabric to help you understand the scale of the print. Usually, the price is listed by the yard. However, pay special attention when ordering online, as sometimes the price is by the half yard. Read each listing carefully to make sure you are ordering the correct amount. If you're unsure if a given fabric will work for a pattern, ask a fabric store worker and they may be able to point you in the right direction. Before ordering expensive fabric online, I recommend ordering a swatch. When you buy a swatch, the fabric store will send you a small sample of the fabric to test out to see if it will work for your project. Now let's talk about interfacing. 
The purpose of interfacing is to provide greater strength, structure, or stability to a fabric. It's often used when making bags, and it's applied to areas on garments that need greater structure, like buttonholes or collars. Interfacing can be either fusible or sew-in. Fusible interfacing has an adhesive side, and the glue melts when ironed, so it can adhere to your fabric. Sew-in interfacing is usually basted to the edges of your fabric within the seam allowance, or it can be quilted to your fabric. Woven interfacing has a grain, just like woven fabric. Non-woven interfacing has a sort of stiff, papery feel, so it works for craft projects, but it's not recommended for apparel. And then knit interfacing is stretchy, so it works with knit fabrics. If you're using a lightweight fabric, you'll want to use a lightweight interfacing. Similarly, if you are using a heavyweight fabric, you'll want to have a heavyweight interfacing. To apply fusible interfacing, lay the fabric with the wrong side facing up on your ironing board. Place the fusible interfacing with the bumpy or glue side down on the wrong side of your fabric. Then place a damp press cloth on top. Iron for 15 seconds on high heat. Pick up and move the iron to the next section and repeat until all of the interfacing has fused. Now let's talk about how to read and follow along with a commercial sewing pattern. On your pattern envelope, there's a lot of information. First, you'll see a pattern difficulty rating. There will be images of the garment on the front to give you an idea of what the finished piece will look like. On the back, you'll usually see some style illustrations and different views and options. Technical illustrations help you understand the lines of the pattern more accurately. You'll see some charts related to your body size and usually the finished size of the garment. We'll cover this more in depth later. Look for fabric suggestions. These are guidelines for the kinds of fabric you can use. These aren't the only options, but it does give you some direction when choosing fabric. You should also see a fabric yardage chart. It usually includes how much yardage you will need for each size, depending on the width of your fabric. So check the yardage chart for the different widths and sizes and views, and this will determine how much fabric to purchase. You'll also want to check for a list of notions. Your pattern will list other items that you'll need, such as interfacing, buttons, zippers, thread, or a hook and eye closure. Let's talk a little bit more about sizing and measurements. Remember that pattern sizes don't correspond to retail sizes. You should not choose a size based on your usual retail size. You see two charts here, body measurements and the finished garment measurements. First look at the body measurements. Make sure to measure yourself so you can pick the right size. Then you'll want to consult the finished garment measurements to determine how much ease or extra room is in the garment. So what is ease? Ease is the difference between your body measurements and the size of the actual garment. For example, if the garment is 38 and a half inches at the bust and your bust is 34 inches, the ease would be 38.5 minus 34, which is four and a half inches. In this case, four and a half inches of ease might be too much for some people's preference, so they might want to size down. Wearing ease is the minimum amount of ease required to allow you to wear something and move comfortably. If you made clothing to your exact measurements, they would be skin tight and you wouldn't be able to move your arms, bend over, or eat. Style ease, on the other hand, is extra ease added for stylistic reasons. A peasant blouse has a lot of style ease in it, whereas a tailored button-up shirt might have considerably less ease. You can size up or down if you prefer less or more ease. When choosing a size, take ease into account. Often commercial sewing patterns assume you want more ease than you actually do. I frequently size down one size. So how much ease do you need? 
For a fitted garment, you'll want to have two to four inches of ease in the bust, a minimum of half an inch to one and a half inches in the waist, and two to four inches in the hips. There's also something called negative ease. Negative ease occurs in stretchy clothing, like tight-fitting t-shirts and yoga pants. The garment is actually smaller than your body measurements and stretches to fit your body. You should take your measurements wearing the undergarments that you plan to wear with your final piece. You'll want to take your measurements again each time you make a garment as these can fluctuate. Hold the measuring tape snugly but not too tightly. Take a deep breath in and then out and relax. You should be able to fit a finger or two under the tape. If you have a measuring buddy there, it can help. To measure your bust, measure across the widest part of your bust, keeping the measuring tape level with the ground. To measure your waist, measure just below the rib cage, usually at the narrowest part of your torso. To measure your hip, you want to measure the widest part of your hip. On most people, this is lower on the hip, around the widest part of your butt and hips. Most women's patterns are drafted for 5 foot 5, so knowing your height can help you determine how much you might need to shorten or lengthen a pattern. When you open up your pattern, make sure to take a careful look at the pattern instructions. You'll likely see a list of all the pattern pieces, the different views, and which pattern pieces to use for each view. Read the instructions closely about how to use the pattern. You'll likely see a glossary of sewing terms, which will include different techniques such as stay stitching and an explanation of what that term means. Somewhere on your pattern or on your pattern instructions, you should see a pattern legend telling you how to read the pattern. It'll explain what the different symbols mean and how different sizes are indicated. You'll see how notches, buttonholes, gathering stitches are indicated, and how the grain line and fold line is indicated. Check to see if your seam allowances are included in the pattern pieces, or if they need to be added. The pattern might say something like, 5 8 seam allowance included on pattern, or the instructions will say, 5 8 seam allowance throughout pattern unless otherwise noted. Most commercial sewing patterns do include the seam allowance, so you shouldn't need to add it. While it is an option to cut out the original tissue paper pattern, I don't recommend doing that. If you trace the pattern instead, you can preserve the original pattern and have access to all the other sizes if you choose to make the pattern again, either once you change sizes or if you're making the pattern for someone else. To trace the pattern, you can use pattern paper, Swedish tracing paper, Pellon 830 interfacing, craft store tracing paper, parchment paper, or rolls of medical exam paper. Start by pre-washing and ironing your fabric. You may want to iron your pattern pieces as well with a dry iron on low heat. Check the cutting diagram that comes with your pattern. Most cutting layouts will indicate that fabric should be folded in half lengthwise so that the selvage edges meet along the sides. Then you cut everything with the fabric folded. The cutting layout is your map of how you should place your pattern pieces, but you don't have to follow it exactly. You'll want to pay attention to the grain line markings on your pattern pieces and pay attention to what needs to be cut on the fold. So I'm working with a fat quarter here, but I folded it parallel to the selvage. And I'm going to place this pattern piece right here on that fold line. That way the piece will become doubled when I cut it out. My other pattern piece doesn't need to be put on the fold line, but I do need to make sure I line up the grain line correctly. 
To do this, I measure from one end of that grain line arrow to the edge of my fabric. Then I measure at the other end of the grain line arrow to make sure it's the same distance. Then pin your pattern pieces to your fabric through both layers or use pattern weights and cut out your pattern pieces. Use fabric shears or a rotary cutter to cut right along the line of the pattern pieces. Accurate cutting is essential. Now it's time to transfer your markings. Notches are usually indicated by these little triangles along the edge of your patterns. And these are used to help you line up two different pattern pieces when stitching them together. You transfer these notches by clipping into the fabric. If you have a very small seam allowance, like a quarter inch, it's better to use a marker so you don't risk snipping past the seam allowance. Another method is to use fabric markers and pins. Place a pin through the mark, then you'll open up so you can get to the fabric and mark where that pin is with your fabric marker. A third method is to use transfer paper. Place the transfer paper with the chalky side facing your fabric and the pattern piece on top. Trace over the pattern markings with a blunt embossing tool or a tracing wheel. If you have two pieces, you'll need to repeat on the other side. If that mark is too faint, you can always trace over it again with your fabric marker. So there is a lot of assumed knowledge when you are sewing. There are a lot of things that your pattern won't mention. First of all, it's important to press your seams. That means you iron each seam as you go. Often you press the seam allowance open or to the back, or you press around the edge like a neckline or on a hem. You can't sew effectively without pressing. Next, you'll need to remember to backstitch at the beginning and end of every seam. Your pattern will not say that you should do that, but it's assumed that you will always backstitch unless you are basting or gathering fabric. The pattern may tell you to finish your seams in the usual manner or with your preferred method. You can do many things such as zigzag stitch, a mock overlock stitch, bias binding, French seams, flat felt seams, pinking shears, or use a serger. It's important to finish your seams, especially when working with a woven fabric. It prevents your fabric from unraveling and it'll make it last a lot longer, but it'll usually be up to you how you go about finishing them. Your pattern may not say anything about how to fit the pattern. It's best to start sewing things that are easy to fit, like loose fitting skirts, or a loose fitting blouse or dress, then move on to more fitted patterns. You'll need to make a muslin for any new fitted pattern you are making to test the fit of the pattern and make alterations. There are tons of resources out there for understanding what kinds of pattern adjustments you might need to make, depending on how your body differs from industry standard. Everybody's body is unique, so it may take some practice and research to figure out exactly what changes you might need to make. You can also baste your seams together first and check the fit. See if you need to shorten the straps or take in the side seams. We call this fit as you go. It's important to try on your garment as you're making it to see what you need to change. When you first learn to sew, I would start with craft projects Try out some easy bags before you start sewing apparel. When you do start sewing apparel, 
Try a gathered skirt or elastic waist skirt as you only have one area to fit, which is the waist. You could also try some loose fitting blouses or dresses. Avoid anything with too many new techniques or anything requiring very slippery or difficult to handle fabric. And I would also stick to woven fabric at first. Once you're ready to move on to harder projects, investigate the many online resources that explain new techniques and fitting. The big four sewing pattern companies are Simplicity, Vogue, McCall's, and Butterick. These patterns are easy to find at your local Joann's, but sometimes the pattern instructions have limited pictures and they can be challenging for beginners. All of these indie pattern companies pictured here offer thorough instructions with lots of pictures, online videos, and sew-alongs. Tilly and the Buttons is really great. They also have several beginner-friendly books. There's also Closet Core Patterns, Seamwork Patterns, Grain Line Studio, and Helen's Closet. Often people will ask where to buy fabric. There are some great online shops like Hearts Fabric, Stone Mountain, and Daughter Fabrics, which both have great fabric collections of apparel fabric as well as quilting cottons. Wawak is a great source for notions like thread and other sewing tools. Etsy is also a great source for fabric. It helps to know exactly what you are looking for when you search on Etsy. I often search Etsy for my favorite fabric designers or manufacturers like Cotton and Steel, Rifle Paper Company, Art Gallery Fabrics, and Ruby Star Society. In terms of local fabric stores, Remainders Creative Reuse is in Pasadena and they are a second-hand seller of fabric and other craft items. Quilt and Things Fiber Arts is in La Crescenta and they sell high-quality quilting cottons. Cat's Quilting Corner is in Monrovia and they also sell high-quality quilting cottons. Of course, there's Joanne. Um, there's one in La Cañada and one in Alhambra and another location in Glendale, so they are all over the place. They sell quilting cotton and some apparel fabric as well as other craft supplies. Lastly, there's Mood Fabrics, which is near downtown LA. It can be a little bit intimidating to shop in there as it is huge, but they have an online shop if you'd rather look there. Last, I just wanted to point you towards some great books and online resources. So you can get any of these books at the Pasadena Public Library. First, there's Gertie Sews Jiffy Dresses by Gretchen Hirsch. This is a really beginner-friendly sewing book with dresses that are easier to fit and quick to sew. Sewing Basics for Everybody by Wendy Ward has unisex patterns, um, basics from shirts to hoodies to pants. Then there's Breaking the Pattern, A Modern Way to Sew. And this is a Scandinavian clothing pattern book. It's drafted for 5'8", so if you are a taller person, this is a great book for you. Next is Sew Your Own Wardrobe by Allison Smith. This includes multiple patterns and has a great overview of techniques, including how to fit patterns. Stitch Sewing Organizers, Pretty Cases, Boxes, Pouches, Pincushions, and more is another great one if you're looking to do more crafty sewing. Then there's Bags and Totes, 10 Easy Fashionable Projects Anyone Can Sew. Machine Sewing, 25 Quick and Easy Projects to Build Your Skills. And then lastly, Animal Friends to Sew, Simple Handmade Decor, Toys, and Gifts for Kids. This is a great one if you are sewing for kids. It's got some really cute patterns. And then a few online resources I will point you towards. There's The Fold Line, which is a great resource for searching for patterns, reading pattern reviews, and purchasing patterns. There are a lot of great YouTube channels for sewing tutorials. Professor Pincushion, Made Every Day, Made to Sew, Threads, Alexandra Morgan, and Gina Renee Designs are some that I go to a lot. The Kirby Sewing Collective is another great place to go if you're looking for plus size patterns or if you're looking for a good resource for sewing techniques. Last, you can go to allfreesewing.com and find lots of free tutorials and sewing patterns.
So I hope this video has helped to demystify the world of fabric and sewing patterns. Happy sewing!